I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! You got space, man, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi everyone, you're watching the Wrestle Rock Podcast Season 4. Uh, I'm Johnny D, your host for this uh, episode, I, and I am with my partner Benoit, aka Nostradamus Ben. How's you going, my friend, today? Fine, and you? Yes, I'm going super great. Uh, today we have uh, a legend. Yes, <laughs> a big legend. Uh, yes, a big legend. Um, and he is a former uh, WWE talent. Um, TNA uh, talents and also a pro wrestling uh, Noah talents. I'm talking about Joe E. Legend. Welcome. Hey, how's he going, my friend, today? Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. You're welcome. All right. So, uh, we're going forward with uh, some questions. So, Let's go, my friend. Okay. Can I, can I call you Mr. Legend or Mr. Etchen? <laughs> Joe's fine. Okay, <laughs> okay, Joe, uh, what's your favorite sport uh, besides pro wrestling? Favorite sport besides pro wrestling would probably be kickboxing because I did that for a bunch of years. Okay. I have, four, I have four black belts in karate and kung fu, so I used to do that before I got into wrestling. Oh, you were a fighter? Um, team, fight, team sport, probably football. Even though I'm Canadian, it should be hockey. Um, and then now my one son plays handball. Okay. And I've kind of be, I kind of become a fan of that, especially because it looks like he might be going pro as a goalie. So that's rapidly climbing the list of my favorite sports. Nice. And we would like to know, uh, when you started your wrestling career, who was your favorite uh, wrestler, your, uh, how we said... Uh, a childhood uh, idol. Yes, exactly. Your, child, uh, your, your childhood uh, icons or... Um, when I first started watching wrestling, I didn't watch it on TV. I used to go and see it at Scarborough Arena in the okay. East End of Toronto. My dad used to take me, and it was the uh, the Bear Man shows, and it used to have the original Sheik there. And okay. so the first, yeah. Show, yeah, the first show we ever saw, the main event was uh, the original Sheik. Sabu's on goal. Yes, Sabu's on goal. Yeah, the, the Sabu's on goal. I can't remember what. I, she had a belt. I can't remember what belt. It might have been the United States belt, which doesn't make sense for Canada, but what are you going to do? Um, but it, he wrestled Bobo Brazil, and Bobo oh, Brazil nice. was yeah. awesome. Bobo was the dude. As far as I was concerned, when I when I first started watching, Bobo was the man. He was great. Uh, but then there's a Louis Martinez. There's a few other guys on those shows, which I liked. But then when I started watching it on TV and decided this is what I want to do for a living, the three influences that that brought me to the wrestling game as a performer – were Ric Flair, Randy Savage, and Roddy Piper. Nice. And okay, uh, yeah. Roddy Piper is a uh, Canadian, of course. Yeah. Well, no. he was a Canadian. Go okay. ahead, yeah, of course. It says uh, here that you were trained by Ron, Ron Oid Hutchinson and yep. Sweet Daddy Seki. Yep. How many months of training did it take before you could wrestle in front of a real crowd? Well, it was, uh, that varies. I can give you two answers on that. Um, I was in there for about six months and I was ready to go. But the trouble was uh, Ontario was so heavily regulated at the time that nobody ran any shows because it would cost you if the, if the township was under a hundred thousand people, it cost, I think 20, 20 grand or something to run a show. Mm -hmm. And if it was over a hundred thousand, it was like 35 grand or something. So nobody ran any shows because nobody ran any legal shows. There were some illegal shows. Uh, outlaw mud shows, as Jim Cornette would say. Um, but there were very few legal shows. And when they did run legal shows, they tended to go with the old timers uh, who, who were established. You know, they could trust. They, well, they're gonna, if I'm running a show and it's only one show a year, I'm going to go to guys I trust. So unfortunately, I, I, it struggled for me to kick in the door. I ended up being there about two years. 
until Ron and, and Seeky were able to find ways to get me on. Um, Tiger Jeet Singh yeah. had a um, an Indian festival out, and I think it was Brantford, Brampton. It was a huge Indian festival, and he ran wrestling. So Ron, you know, Seeky and, and Tiger have been friends forever. So they found a way to be able to put us on the show. But that wasn't because we were the best wrestlers in the world or anything. It's because Seeky was kind enough to call in a favor, and Tiger was kind enough to give us the opportunity. So it took me two years to get on to my first show, even though I was ready after about six months. You were very lucky because in my mind, uh, Sweet Daddy Siki is one of the best uh, black men uh, yeah. of all time. Honestly, he have a big, he had a big charisma, and uh, he's very a talented. Yeah, really, really. The thing is, you don't get, you don't get just how how smart he was as a wrestler because it, like it gets kind of buried in the gimmick. But yeah. I remember we would be training at the gym. It would be me and Edge and Christian and Swinger and Zach Wild, a whole gang of us. We're all training, and like you know, you're new, so when you're training at the gym, it's you and your buddies, and you just do everything you saw on TV last week. And it doesn't make any sense, and the match goes too long, and you just beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> and after 45 minutes of this. You say, so what'd you think, Ron? And Ron would go, good God, grab a headlock. That was terrible. And we didn't realize it was terrible. We just thought he was, you know, oh, you just don't know the new stuff. Ron knew exactly what he was talking about. We didn't know what we were doing. But then he'd say, you know, Seeky, what did you think? And the whole time, Seeky would be sitting there with his eyes closed, like drifting off to sleep. And we thought, oh, what's he going to say? And he would all of a sudden turn to me and go, Joe, about two minutes in, you, got, you had your feet wrong on the headlock. And I'd review Son of, son of a gun. I did have my feet wrong. How did he see that? I don't know. But he was so smart that you didn't you didn't appreciate how smart he was until you actually were around him. But a brilliant, brilliant uh, wrestling man. And when I think uh, about um, Joey Legend, I think about the AWF because 15 okay. years ago, I discovered Joey Legend there because there was a lot of ta talents uh, was there like, as... Uh, Gail Kim, Trish Stratus, Edge Christian, you of course, and many and many Quebec uh, talent as uh, Jackal, Frankie the Mobster, and yes, uh, many other Montreal uh, guys. Yes, Montreal guys. And uh, do you have uh, good? Um, you had good moments on the uh, AWF, my friend. Um, what was nice about the AWF stuff is that. It's even though I was only kind of new to the business, I was a senior member of the team because I was the only one who kind of been out beyond Southern Ontario. Uh, I'd obviously done Southern Ontario stuff, but then we were going down to Detroit regularly. Okay. Started off about once every six weeks, ended up going down about once every two weeks because business was really picking up down there. But also I'd gone to Japan a couple of times for FMW and NOW. I'd gone to South Africa. This is before Germany though. But like I, I'd been around, I, I traveled a few places. So what was cool about the AWF thing is that I actually kind of, even though I was younger, I was still a senior member of the team. So I didn't have to argue to get things in and be like, this is what I think we should do. And people would usually kind of go with it because I was just more experienced. And for the most part, it worked. I mean, there's certain things, of course, you're, you're going to drop the ball on. But I think it gave me a little more confidence going in. So I felt confident going into the AWF locker room nice. and being around a bunch of talents who, you know, they were they were smart. They weren't just kind of there to show off to their friends in the audience. They actually wanted to do a proper wrestling performance to uh, to draw a crowd, to, to be professionals about it, not just be hobbyists. So being around that locker room was good because I like being around people who try, who try hard to be professional. Uh, that was not easy in professional wrestling, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead. Okay, Joe, uh, can you tell us about the Tug Life stable, which included uh, you, Edge Christian, Zach uh, Wild, Bloody Bill Scullion, and Rhino? Yeah, well, don't forget, you can't forget our manager, handsome Johnny Bradford, wrestling's only deaf manager. Um, yeah. What it was is that a Adam and I, Edge, we were called, we were a tag team called Sex and Violence. Now, get a good look at me and figure out which one was sex and which one was violence, right? I'm clearly violence. So <laughs> we went down to Detroit uh, because one of the referees from Detroit, A.T. Huck, is a wonderful guy. He came up to watch us on a show Bill Scullion put together. I think it was Outlaw, Outlaw Championship or something it was called. Anyways, we, were, we ended up being the tag champs there. 
And Huck really liked us. So he said, why don't you come down to Detroit and work our guys? Oh, great. So we went down there, but we were trying to figure out a way to get immediate heat. And we thought, well, Canada doesn't really have any heat at that moment with America. So Adam and I decided we would be from New Jersey because the New Jersey Devils had just swept Detroit in the Stanley Cup. So we came out wearing New Jersey Devils uh, sweaters and trecos and come out with uh, we came out with brooms and swept our way to the ring and stuff just to You're piss talking them about off. in 1995. Yeah, I guess yeah, it must have been there. Yeah, the first there. stop of the uh, Devils, yeah, 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 was in 1995. Yeah. Yeah. So we did that, and we, you know, we were hanging out with Rhino a lot because just, you know, great guy. And then I started getting Rhino to come to Winnipeg with us. So we really kind of bonded on the road, you know, Brothers of the Road, as Roddy Piper would say. So everything was working out well there. Uh, Zach Wild, Keith is his real name. He used to come down to Detroit all the time, El Fuego Kid, Swinger. We all started doing really well in Detroit. And it got to a point where they wanted to do kind of a, a breakdown of the tag team with me and Edge, me and Adam. It's like we shouldn't. Like right now, we're doing really, really well. Taking us apart isn't gonna isn't gonna help anything. It's too soon. But we we decided to kind of do a swerve. So we did this thing where we wrestled each other, had a hell of a match. I've got it on tape somewhere still, for that matter. We had a hell of a match. Towards the end of the match, we get into this big fight, and Christian comes out in the middle of it and says, "Hey, come on, guys, you, you can't be fighting each other." You know, Adam, you and I have been friends forever, and you know. Legend, you helped train me, and you know we got, we got to be buddies. We got to work together. I mean, what's with these stupid Americans here? I mean, they even made you say you're from New Jersey. You're not. You're from Canada. <laughs> and so we begun the Canada versus America angle, and then Rhino came in and joined us. So Rhino's from Detroit, clearly. I mean, you see it all over his gear, but he was trained in Hamilton for a while, so he was claiming to be from Hamilton. Interesting. And then, of course, Bradford, just the best guy. He he was you know, our our manager. So we started doing the pro Canada versus America thing. You know, we'd burn the American flag in the ring and <laughs> yeah, not kidding. We did it. It was right in the news too. Like I guess, I guess we could have got arrested at the time, but fortunately I guess the cops were marks or something cause they didn't arrest us. But then about three, four weeks later, we thought we were like so smart, but then three or four weeks later, Bret Hart started his pro Canada versus America angle and made ours look weak cause he had the little WWE machine. So if nothing else, I can say we were ahead of the curve by about three weeks. <laughs> and it wound up being a successful stable because, I mean, they wanted to call us the Canadian World Order. I was like, eh, that's so weak. And then I think it was, I want to say it was Christian who said, what about Thug Life? Because he saw the NWO jump somebody backstage on TV and then Kevin Nash leaned into the camera and said, Thug Life, baby, yeah. And that just, <laughs> that just kind of hung in the air, so. We said, yeah, Thug Life, you know, it's better than just kind of CWO. It's just such a ripoff of NWO. It's too too derivative. We want to do something a little bit different. And it worked. We just, we drew great houses, um, had excellent matches, and, and had good heat across the board. It was a great time. Detroit was a fun time. Loved it. Nice. And just er earlier, you're uh, talking about um... – during all your wrestling career, you're traveling all around the world. So yeah. you've been wrestling in Europe for uh, several times, several years, of course. In your opinion, uh, which European countries have the best uh, eat and reaction with wrestling fans? The best crowd? Yes. And uh, for you, uh, what is the best wrestling promotion uh, oh, in Europe? In Europe. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I live in Germany now, right? I, I live in Hanover. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I kind of have to say Germany's got a pretty good scene because I don't know if I'm going to get stabbed if I say something different. Um, but I work for, like, there's two wrestling promotions here in Hanover. I teach at both their wrestling schools. Okay. Um, I've been, I just got back this past week. I was in the UK. Uh, I was in Scotland for three days and England for four days. It was my 140th UK tour. So I can't complain about the UK. The UK is treating me pretty well, and they've had some great crowds. Um, I had a good run. Also, I had a TV series in England in 2005. I had, uh, it was a reality series called Celebrity Wrestling. I coached six celebrities. D'Lo Brown coached six celebrities. They gave them wrestling gimmicks. They uh, did like American Gladiators type games, and Roddy Piper hosted it. Okay. So it was, it was a, a great, I mean, English has been a great time for me, but 
Um, I'm going back to Italy shortly. Italy's great. Uh, I go to Spain usually a couple times a year. I've been to France 68 times. France has always been great. France has always treated me really, really well. It's hard to pick one. I can pick like, like Nigeria was probably the worst place I've ever been. It was pretty rough. <laughs> but um, overall, usually I can find something good anywhere. Like um, honestly, wrestling in Moscow is awesome. Nice. Moscow is a great place. I've been there about ten times, and every show. I mean, I uh, I did one show. I wrestled Raven at five or six thousand people. Um, oh, wow. the, night, the night I won the, their belt, I think there was four thousand. I mean, they draw big crowds and just like you just look out the corner of your eye at the crowd and they jump out of their seats. So it's wow. a nice fun crowd because they're into it. They're having fun. They're not just kind of sitting there demanding, well, Meltzer would only say this is three star. They're not into that. They're there to have a good time. And I, I love crowds like that. So, I mean, it varies. I'm 46 countries in, so it's hard to pinpoint one country that's better than all the rest. I do have to say, you know, obviously growing up in Canada, I love Canada. Um, had a great time in the States, Puerto Rico, and obviously Germany. I have to say something good for because this is where my kids are. Did you wrestle for WWC? No, it was for IWA. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was, uh, Carlos was, our, was our opposition at the time. We were doing great. We were doing – in Bayamon for TV every two weeks, we were doing 6,000 people in a hall that held 4,000. So it was you know, just packed. It was great. Puerto Rico. I've heard a million t horror stories about Puerto Rico, and yeah. every one of them is wrong. Val Venus is the one who recommended. If, if, if 100 people I talked to about Puerto Rico, 99 told me, don't go. Val Venus was the one who said go. Val was right. 99 were wrong. Puerto Rico is <laughs> awesome. I loved it. Nice. Okay. Uh, uh, what were your expectations in, with WWE when you signed with it in the early 2000s? Well, originally I was signed up to be a member of the new Freebirds. They were Michael Hayes was, yeah, was restarting yeah. the Freebirds with uh, young guys, and he'd um, he'd done he was manager of the Hardys for like five minutes, and then the Hardys they they went their separate way to do their gimmick, which was the right move for that team. So then he wanted to start the new Freebirds. So I was hired on to be kind of the Terry Gordy of the team, most. But by between the time they signed me and the time they got my visa together. Mike had decided he'd rather just be a backstage producer and not be on camera anymore. Mm -hmm. So that kind of screwed me because then they didn't have plans for me. So my expectation was to be a new Freebird, which is hilarious because, like, I'm a fan of the Freebirds. I think they were great. I had a great time watching them as a kid, and I liked the whole gimmick. But, I mean, I'm not from the South. Um, I tended to technical wrestle more than brawl, and I don't drink. So <laughs> I'm the last guy who should have been a Freebird, but... Mike wanted me as a freebird, so I was going to be a freebird. That was yeah. my expectation. Was I was going to be a sober freebird. Who'd have thought? <laughs> and that's a big challenge when you have a three hundred pounds on your shoulder. So if you yeah, uh, yeah. Well, like, uh, Terry Gordy cast a, a broad shadow, man. That guy was a super talent. So to be mentioned in the same breath as him is is very flattering. To be said that I should go in and be, you know try and be like him. And they think that I can get there to the point that Michael Hayes is the one who says I should get there meant a lot to me. That, that, that was a huge compliment. And mostly when you have, um, uh, well, uh, Michael Hayes as a gorilla position. Yeah. 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 He had a lot of pressure. I imagine. Well, if, if there's one guy, if there's one guy who knows how to get over with a crowd, it's Michael Hayes. because Michael Hayes was never a great wrestler. He had a he had a punch and a DDT and the worst moonwalk in history. Yeah, but he used it. It all worked well. He knows how to get over, and he knows tag team wrestling. Like yeah. you might, you know, there's different things you, people can complain about. But um, I had never had a bad experience with Michael Hayes. Michael yeah. Hayes was 100% honest, straightforward, wonderful with me. Um, and there are people who have different opinions about him. I know Mark Henry had a bit of heat with him and such, but um, no one can deny that. Not number one, that Michael Hayes knows tag team wrestling, and number two, that he should be the quarterback of a tag team division because he knows how to get not just wrestlers over but characters over, and it's characters that draw money. Mm. Well, okay, yeah. Uh, in TNA, who was behind the name of the Red Shirt Security Team on which you won the NWA uh, Tag Team Championship with uh, Kevin Northcott? Yeah, North Kevin's a great guy. Truthfully, I don't. 
see, when I was brought in, I'd done the WWA tours in uh, where were we? We were England, Ireland, Scotland, Switzerland, the first tour, and the second tour was Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. And Jared approached me and asked if I want to come work for TNA. I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm going to, I, I was, when I finished up the European one, I was on my way to Puerto Rico to live. And then when I finished up Puerto Rico, we did the Australia and New Zealand. So I was ready to go right from there to, to TNA. So they brought me in as part of Vince Russo's uh, Sports Entertainment Extreme, S-E-X, go figure, uh, faction. And I was there to beat the tar out of Jeff. So when I came in, I jumped Jeff. I beat the tar. We did a little bit of a, a program. And then they didn't quite have anything to do, but they already had a team as red shirt security, but the one guy can't for life. Man, can't remember his name. Great big tall fella. Um, he was moving on to Mexico and they needed somebody to, to kind of step in. We were going to do a three man red shirt security thing. And then long enough to kind of plug me into the team. And then the big guy would kind of filter out and there would just be me and Kevin. I don't know who started it. It was already up and running by the time I got there. Cause I was doing my thing with, uh, with Jared ahead of that. Uh, would like to hear you. What is the best independent wrestling federation in the United States? In your book? In your book? Best independent wrestling promotion, I'll call it. It's hard for me to say because I, I spend so much time in Europe, I don't get to the States enough to watch yeah. it. Oh, okay. I would just, just because he's my buddy and because I, I have wrestled a few of his shows, uh, Rhino runs a promotion uh, yeah. near oh, okay. oh, yeah. IWR. We understand. Yeah, they are, seem to have a and VW, of course. Is uh, it International Wrestling Revolution? It's IWR. I can't remember what GCW, MLW. Yeah. yeah. CZW. Yeah. Yeah, oh, actually, CW. I mean, Malcolm Monroe Jr. I, I might have the wrestling's longest feud go with him. It's like Bruiser Brody and a duel of the butcher type has been going on 20 something years. But me and Malcolm, whenever I get to Detroit, I end up wrestling Malcolm again. He's coming off the top, setting his elbow brace on fire and dropping elbows and such. So I like working for XICW, Malcolm Monroe Jr., fantastic. Love working with those guys. And I'll say IWR for Rhino. Just He's a great guy, does great things, and does stuff for charity too, which I really appreciate. Rhino's, uh, he gives back to his community, which I think is an excellent thing as well. Did you wrestle with uh, Abby or uh, Brody uh, during your wrestling career? I wrestled, I'm sorry. In 1988. Sorry, bro. Bro, died in 1988. Okay, okay. So that, that that's impossible. So, did you wrestle again, uh, Abdul the Butcher, during your wrestling career, or? No, I actually only met him once backstage. Okay. Um, it's weird seeing just because, like, I, I only saw him on TV. You know, the Madman in Sudan, and he had the crazy eyes and the fork and like everything. <laughs> and then he, you know, he comes walk. He's wearing the full getup, and he walks up to you backstage, and I'm like. Uh, Because you're still kind of looking at him through the eyes of a mark, like through the TV. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm polite to everyone. It's like, hello, sir. And he goes, hey, chief. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't expect the madman of Sudan to kind of nod at you, wink, and call yeah, you yeah. chief. You know, that just seems true. weird. It's very different than Abdullah the Butcher, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, it was Abdullah the, the cab yeah. driver. Like, he's just so friendly. Yeah. <laughs> he walks outside of the ring. Yeah, of course. Uh, just before ending, we give you some names and in short sentence, tell us something about him. Sure. Well, um, <laughs> AJ Styles. Uh, loved working with him. Worked with him in TNA a few times. Uh, really, really good human being. Yeah. For a guy who's as successful and as talented as he is, it's never gone to his head. He is a, a grounded, well, well-liked and well-respected guy because he's a good human being. Yeah, and uh, in my mind, AJ Styles is the all, uh, hard work pays off because yeah, God, and he deserved what is he is currently. So you know, yeah, yeah uh, God bless him. He didn't quit. Well done, to him. Times wrestler of the year in PWI. Yes, of course. Three times in a row. Three years yeah. in a row. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Omega. Met him once in Germany. Seems a nice enough guy. Yeah. Um, I know Jim Cornette isn't his biggest fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah. I think uh, I, I'm, I'm happy for him. For a guy who's essentially, from what I'm told, self-trained, mm -hmm. to go out and get to the top of New Japan Wrestling, I mean, he's got to have something going for him. He's charismatic as hell. He's in great shape. 
Yep. And I think it's not a bad idea that he's was programmed in with Don Callis because I've never seen a great Kenny Omega promo. He's a decent promo. And he speaks like fluent Japanese. So that's perfect for Japan. Yeah. But for North America, plug him in with Don Callis, who's I think one of the most underrated Mike men in the business. Uh, he he knew enough to to saddle up with with Don to complete the package. Exactly because he has a really good skill, but uh, there is no promo uh, that, that that is not the support that we're strength wise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Undertaker, um, easily the most respected guy in the business. It's very rare to find somebody who doesn't respect him in some way, and I also appreciate the fact that. Like he went from being this guy, big evil and booze and all this stuff. Now he's, uh, you know, he's come to the end of his career and he decided he wants uh, something better. He's become a big Christian. So I appreciate the fact that he's always had an open mind to better his life and doesn't just kind of follow down one path and be done with it. He's a guy you could talk to about anything. And the last one, Joe E. Legend, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Best wrestling you never heard of. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I would say somebody who likes being a wrestler, loves being a dad, and now uses being a wrestler to try and make his kids proud. Nice. And for ending, uh, first of all, thank you for your 25 already uh, generous minute. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. As usual, my partner, uh, Nostrana Ben, it's all about the French prophet, you know. Uh, I'm a media. Yes, his nickname is all about the French prophets. And he tried mm -hmm. to predict the future of our guests. Okay. Uh, Where is yours? Okay, yeah. Mr. Uh, Joey Legend, uh, with, yes. your, uh, with your sens sensational background, you're going to be the legend of doom. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. okay. That's a funny prediction, but I have a, a, a serious pre prediction too. Uh, okay. prob probably you're gonna make a comeback uh, in TNA for the new TNA because uh, Impact Wrestling is gonna be TNA in January if my memory is good. Yeah. Um, weird thing is, is I just got a phone call about them today from a really? friend of mine. Wow. So yeah, not not for me being there, but um, a friend of mine, his daughter is one of my students, and she's going for a tryout with them. Okay. So I think. He wants you know to talk a little bit about how how a tryout might work and who to speak to and stuff. So I'm getting the vibe that I'll probably get a call from TNA. They'll be asking me, "Do you know this girl?" Is what she says on the level, and of course it is. Um, so who knows? And maybe it'll maybe it'll kick open a door. I'd love to see you know Scott Demore. I'll always consider a great friend, mm -hmm. and uh, they got a load of talent there. I'd love to see it. Uh, I'd love to see it burst forth uh, in a good way. And not just kind of be this quiet league that nobody knows about. I'd love to see them step. I'd love to see them get a hold of CM Punk. He's a guy who needs a platform, and you know, I think he needs TNA as much as TNA needs him if he wants to stay relevant in the business. They could build the entire brand around him. Yeah, of course. And uh, we cross uh, the the finger for a uh, an eventual comeback that will be. Uh, that will be very great. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, if we can see you. Well, fingers you. crossed. I'm getting old, guys. I'm 54, so I'm, fe yeah. I'm feeling the bumps a lot more than 24. Yeah. But if I come back, uh, yeah. you can at least point and laugh at this guy getting <laughs> crawling around backstage going, what the hell was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. It was very appreciated. Oh, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed being on your show. You're welcome. I wish you a lot of success. And we learn a lot of interesting stuff about your career inside uh, of your career in Europe and Canada. That was just fantastic. So thank you so much for your time and have a great day. My Goodbye. Thank you.